Mr. Diggle, thanks for joining me today on the Mark Devine Show. Super stoked to have you here, sir. It's a pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to get into our conversation uh, from a topic that's very, very important and seems to be a lot of um, questions about trust in the in the world today, especially what's been going on the last few years with politics and news media and all that. But, uh, you know, before I, before we get into that and, and you know, like the, the crux of your work, right? give us a sense for, like, Give us a sense for you. Like, wh where are you from? Who, you know, what made you who you are? What were your yeah big big life moments that helped shape your interest in doing what you're doing? That's a, that's a good question. And and there's this apparently Kierkegaard said that life makes sense in reverse. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we've all heard some kind of variation of that, right? But right. I was born and raised in a small town in northern Canada, okay. uh, Fort Saint John, and it was pretty remote. Um, there were about 12,000 people. We were about an, an hour from the next small town. It wasn't that uncommon for it to be minus 40. Mm -hmm. um, right. People had to pull together, right? There was a sense of community. Not that everyone was an angel, but if somebody needed help, you gave them help. Right. And uh, I grew up believing that if I could help people, I should. And so had a fairly strong sense of empathy uh, from that experience. And mm -hmm. then when I was 17, uh, I was playing junior hockey. I got attacked by a fan with a club. No way. Jeez. Yeah. So it dragged me well, halfway over the Well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> it was not helpful. Um, shattered my helmet, knocked me unconscious. Another player grabbed me, beat the tar out of me. Jeez, always. you guys yeah. play rough up there. It was a, it was a rigorous Saturday night. Um, <laughs> and so I ended up with this really severe concussion. And it was in the mid eighties. We didn't really know much about concussions, right? right. So it was, mindset was kind of walk it off. Um, and I knew at the time that I was going vision, legally blind, right? Like I was going to become really legally blind. And so wow. I had always thought that I would train my brain so I could think for a living. Right. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden I can't think at all. Right. Like I've got the mm -hmm. attention span of a fruit fly. Wait, let, let me pause here. So you knew you were going to be go, legally blind before you got attacked i did okay. yeah okay. i had a hereditary retinal disorder that was it was degenerative okay um what was so, that like by the way i mean to know that's coming like how did you prepare for that i don't know if i've ever spoken to someone who like had who their knew? sight and, and then knew they were going to lose it and then and you've lost it, I imagine, or is yeah. So I I can still I can see you know clearly a couple of inches. Okay. Um, after that, everything's pr pretty blurry. I I tell people I can see a couple of feet. Usually they're my own. <laughs> um, but is it correctable? I mean, can you can you no. see through glasses or anything? Interesting. No, I'm missing chromosomes in my uh, retinas. I've got something called cone dystrophy. Got it. Um, and so, um. You know, it's a good question. I mean, it, it puts a lot of things in perspective, right? right? Like uh, aspirations of being a, a an airline pilot are probably out the window. Yeah. Um, and you've got to figure out how you can set yourself up so that mm -hmm. you can be successful down the road. Right. Um, but when you were it, playing hockey when you were 17 or so, you had your eyesight then. Like, so I, had some, I had some sight. Oh, really? Um, you know, it was interesting because I would watch the players and not the puck. Mm -hmm. So I saw the flow of the play. Interesting. And so I could tell where the puck was by the way people were facing and skating and what people were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I went on to play college hockey a year later and my, my coach said to me, he goes, you're six, three, you're 200 pounds. You're leading the league in scoring. He says, how do you find yourself wide open in front of the net all the time? And I said, I just go to open ice. Hmm. Like, they're just open pockets where I can be dangerous. Right. And so I thought about the game in a way that was different. Right. And after you my could experience... Just, you, you, could, uh, you could catch the movement of the puck, right? And, that, that's and the high the, contrast, because it's a black disc on a white surface, right? Right, right. And so if, if it was close to me, I could manage... Um, but I, 
I knew I was going to lose my sight. Um, and now all of a sudden the, the, you know, and I was doing well in school, the thing that had sort of set me apart was now no longer the thing that set me apart. Mm -hmm. And I had the experience of feeling really helpless and hopeless Mm -hmm. and, um, lost. Mm -hmm. And after after you got attacked and. The yeah. Concussion. yeah. Yeah. And I had symptoms for two years afterwards. Yeah. So probably dep- depression is a big, a common side effect of that. So you probably not haven't. uncommon. Yep. Yeah. And uh, a lot of uncertainty because I didn't know what was really wrong with me. I was just so tired all the time, mm-hmm. and I couldn't remember things, and I was having trouble with executive function, and all this stuff that we would know now is yeah, that's what happens when you have a head injury. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they were kind of like you shouldn't be feeling tired now. It's been a couple of months. Right. Um, And so there was this long journey where they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me, you know, and they would test me for mono. And then they say, well, you know, AIDS has a high fatigue rate. I'm like, I don't fit that profile. (laughs) And so, you know, but they would test me. Once they say it, everyone's like, well, really? (laughs) Really? Are you sure? sure? (laughs) And they're like, you know, you could have leukemia. We could test you for leukemia. And so it was a a challenging journey for a few years. And I slowly recovered. Um, But I found myself eventually in school here in Victoria, British Columbia. And people would just sit down next to me on the bus and say, I'm really having a hard time. And so for some reason, complete strangers would just open up to me. Hmm. And I kind of wanted to understand what was driving that. Mm-hmm. And I also thought if this is going to keep happening, I should get paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> free, free therapy is out. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Come on. I, I want to turn in my amateur status and get my, uh, my professional designation. Yeah. And, and so I started down a path towards becoming a clinical psychologist. Okay. Right. So I, I'm, taking psychology courses and I'm working with troubled teens and street kids and um, families in crisis and working on crisis lines and all those kinds of things. Hmm. And after a while, I come to realize that a lot of the folks I'm working with are just doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. And that even if I had a a plan for them to move forward, they couldn't follow it. Mm -hmm. And I thought this will drive me insane. And so I shifted and went into public administration. I was working in native land claims here in British Columbia. Mm-hmm. And they would ask me these deep philosophical questions like, you know, what is self-government? Or what will the province look like 50 years after claims are settled? The last question they asked me was, how do we convince a group of people we've shafted for over 100 years they should trust us? <laughs> yeah, that's a biggie. That's a biggie <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I went, man, that's a good question. Well, and I'm, that, I'm impressed they were even thinking that way. Right, because I don't get the yeah. impression, like here in America, that a lot of people are thinking that way about social justice. They're really more thinking, uh, how do we kind of get out of the guilt and the shame? Of it? Yeah, and and a lot of people very self-involved and not thinking about the perspective of somebody else. That's right. Yeah, that's the challenge. Mm-hmm. And so, I went to Duke and did my PhD on building trust in hostile environments because I wanted to understand this felt like one of those long-term disputes that just doesn't seem to go away. Mm -hmm. And there's other examples of that in the world. Mm -hmm. And why are they so resilient? Like they don't do us any good after a certain period of time. They're just painful. People have trouble letting go. The old Hatfield and McCoy story, right? Played out at a big scale. Yeah. Interesting. So I started reading all the literature on trust and trying to understand it. And it turned out that there were two people at Duke when I was there who were considered leading experts in theory on the topic of trust. And they were both on my committee. Hmm. And I started sort of looking at the research and seeing that most of it was treating trust like a black box. Like there was some kind of antecedent that popped up out here and then trust would just pop out the other side. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, we got to have a better understanding of what's going on than that. And is it really just memorizing a couple of levers that we can pull? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, be authentic unless your authentic self is somebody I don't like, then don't be authentic at all. Um, (laughs) 
And so I developed a model for understanding how people make the decision to trust mm -hmm. and then how we actually can intervene to make it easier for people to trust us. So mm -hmm. how does trust work and how do we build it? Mm -hmm. And when I finished, the two people on my committee who were experts sat down with me and we had a drink. They said, okay, so you first came to us and we, the two of us had a conversation. And we said, too big, too complicated, he never solves it. Mm -hmm. They said, we'll give him six months, he'll come crawling back. <laughs> we'll and we'll let, him, a little bit. Yeah. we'll let him chisel off a little piece of this and that'll be his thesis. Right. They said, six months in, you were so far beyond us, we couldn't help anymore. All mm -hmm. we could do is sit and watch. And here we are two years later, we think you've solved it. And so I left there, went to work for McKinsey and Company, big management consulting firm, where I started to actually apply some of this work. And the learning curve is just remarkable when mm -hmm. you're actually out in the field and you're, you're, you're armed with theory. You're solving it for individuals or, or teams? Or and organizations, and organizations. yeah. organizations, yeah, interesting. So small scale at first. That's a big one. And then... I got, I was involved in a car accident on the way to a client site, ended up with post-concussion syndrome. Mm. So I'd had 10 concussions by this point. Um, and now I, it was just one too many and mm -hmm. I couldn't go back to that work. Mm -hmm. And so I started a small company called Trust Unlimited and started working with clients. You know, my first client was a mutual fund company. It was one of the guys I'd worked with had become head of strategy. Mm -hmm. And he said, just come talk to us. Mm -hmm. And so he said, talk to us about sustainable competitive advantage. I said, well, that means you do something your competition doesn't that they can't copy. I said, you don't do anything I can't copy. Mm -hmm. You know, I buy one share of every fund you have. Now I know how they're all built. Mm -hmm. And so I could sell what you sell at a discount because I don't have to pay the fund advisor. And... I said, the only way you can differentiate yourselves is to build deep, long-term relationships with your customers. Right. And they said, that's it. That's our strategy. And over 18 months, I trained everyone. I developed the first workshop. I trained everyone in their organization. After 18 months, they hired a professional survey firm, found out that trust was the primary driver of the sales decision, and that they were dramatically more trusted than any of their competitors. Mm -hmm. And they generated 75 cents of every new dollar that came into the industry for the next two years. Hmm. Yeah. So from that, I knew, okay, what I have isn't perfect, but it works. Mm -hmm. And so I started applying it to nonprofits and public sector and private sector and all over the planet. And the Canadian military asked me to help them try to figure out how to build trust with the locals in Afghanistan. Um, and all this time I'm learning, right? I'm, I'm learning more and more about how it works and how to explain it in a way that people get it. Mm. how to help them change behavior patterns to build trust with other people. That's amazing. So, you know, in my latest book, uh, Staring Down the Wolf, I have like seven, I call them commitments that build elite teams. And the first three, which are like a foundational pyramid, are courage, trust, and respect. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I put courage first is because it, it takes courage, right, to be trustworthy it does and then yeah. from from the ability to be trustworthy trust can be built right so it it start from my my perspective it's got to start with you trust starts with you <laughs> meaning like I, if you're, you're yeah. the one that's seeking trust then be trustworthy and that right. and that means you got to be courageous to uh you know to do a number of uh things well and 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 to take you know responsibility for when things don't go so well and, you know, and a few other things. So I'm curious to hear your perspective on like, I, I what, agree how, how so wholeheartedly it? with you because trust is a willingness to be vulnerable. Right. Yeah. When we can't completely predict how someone else is going to behave. Exactly. And, and if I want you to trust me, I need to have the courage to go first. Right. I need to be willing to be vulnerable to you first to initiate a normal reciprocity. And if I'm a leader, I got to have the stones to actually lead with imperfections. I love that. I love you said that because that's, you know, my title of that book is called Staring Down the Wolf, which means for a leader to stare down their fear, stare down their shadow, stare down their perfectionism, stare down all the isms. 
Yeah. And just be okay just being you today and just yeah. show up the best the best you can. Well, and once we once we lead with imperfection, we we show people that we're human, that we can right. make mistakes. We give them permission to make mistakes themselves. Right. And that's how we learn and grow and develop. Right. You know, I mean, Mark, I don't know about you, but the first time I try something, I'm not great at it. <laughs> you know, well, I make mistakes. I'm perfect at everything I try. Well, yeah, no, I thought you probably were. I had that sense, but <laughs> but not. Yeah. Right? And and what made a great leader 10 years ago is not the same thing that makes a great leader today. That's for sure. Especially after and, after COVID, right? And I think this conversation is so important because everybody seems to be suffering because the veil of perfectionism had been stripped away. Like all leaders who just thought they could just keep on doing the same thing and expecting different results, they're getting a dull thud in response from their teams. Right. And people are just quitting or they're just saying, screw it. You know, I'm not, I'll work here, but I'm not going to put out for you because, you know, you're toxic. And and it's not that right. the guy is negative or the, the person is negative. It's, it's that idea that they're right and and you've got to basically, you know, Prove it to yourself that they're right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and it's the same thing with trust. The things that used to work 10 years ago don't work anymore. Isn't that interesting? I remember so, reading Stephen Covey's Speed of Trust. So okay. are, you, are you saying some of that stuff is kind of obsolete, some of what he wrote about? So Stephen R. Covey, that is. Yeah. Um, wow. So there's Can nothing up wrong. open up Pandora's box there? <laughs> well, it's just I don't want to be rude. Yeah. Right? He's a popular um, author. He wasn't a scholar, so we'll give him that, right? Yeah, he's a popular author, not a scholar, right? That's a fair distinction. And and most of his work kind of lines up. So when I started really looking at this, I realized that if trust is the willingness to be vulnerable, when we can't predict how someone is going to behave, there's elements of vulnerability and uncertainty in that mm -hmm. definition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually believe that when we're deciding to trust, we ask ourselves two fundamental questions. And I'm not dodging the Stephen R. Covey question. Okay. Um, I'm come, I'll circle back to we'll it. Come back to it. Yeah. Fine. So first question we ask is how likely am I to be harmed, which is perceived uncertainty. The second question we ask is if I'm harmed, how bad is it going to hurt, which is uh -huh. perceived vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Those things multiply together to give us a level of perceived risk. Mm -hmm. we psychological safety is, is the is – the, how you perceive the environment to protect you from that perceived level of risk. Right. I think that psychological safety occurs when we have high trust environments. Right. Totally. It's an okay. outcome of that. Okay. Makes sense. And so uncertainty times vulnerability equals risk. We have a threshold of risk that we can tolerate. Right. If we go beyond that threshold, we don't trust. If we're beneath it, then we do. And so that means early in relationships, uncertainty is usually pretty high. It probably also that means, means we can only tolerate a small range of vulnerability and still fit below, below that threshold. As those relationships deepen, mm -hmm. the uncertainty starts to drop, and that means the range of vulnerability we can tolerate starts to grow. And that's what deep relationships look like. Mm -hmm. And so for us... It's that the depth of hurt that you allow grows as well. It does. Because if you if greater trust, like with my teammates in the SEALs, like, you know, if I'm working with them for three years... And suddenly someone, you know, does something really screwed up. I give them a lot of rope, right? And say, okay, you know, I, you know you've been great for three years. You, you made a lot of deposits in the emotional bank account. So I'll cut you some slack for that one. But if right. that happens right away, I'm like, okay, dude, you're out of here. Yeah. There's small bounces and uncertainty we can tolerate, right? Right. And it's like, I got three years of evidence versus this one mess up. Right. Okay. Like I'm, I'm willing to be patient and check, but I'm, yeah. I'm also possibly, possibly a little more hesitant, right? That's right. That that range that of vulnerability might shrink a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So, if we're going to talk about building trust, then it's it's where does uncertainty come from? How do we take steps to reduce it? Where does vulnerability come from? How do we take steps to manage that? Mm -hmm. And there are other levers that we can pull. That you know, we 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 have perceived outcomes which means we may have dramatically different perceptions of the exact same event. And that feeds back into our next interaction with those people. And in the middle of all this is our emotional states, mm -hmm. whether we like or dislike someone else. 99% mm -hmm. of the trust literature treats people like rational actors. Right. And it's I'm not, assuming it's, you've met emotional. people. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the I'm more emotional we become, <laughs> the less rational we are, right? That's right. So exactly. Covey's work actually talks about a subset of uncertainty. It's the individual components of uncertainty. And right. it's it's not in misalignment with most of the other trust literature. So it's, and it's strictly relational one-on-one. -on -one. He's like, He's talking about what are the things that I can do as an individual. Yeah. But he's, uncertainty comes from two places. It comes from us as individuals and it comes from the context that we're embedded in. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, the example I like to use is a doctor's office. You go to a doctor's office, they say, take off your clothes and y you do. <laughs> Mark, I've tried that in other places. Yeah. It doesn't work at the grocery store. It's, no. <laughs> Right? Like, and I tell them I'm a doctor. Um, doesn't help. Doesn't help. Right? And if, if we took that example, we, we took those same two people dressed the same way and we moved them from a, a doctor's office to a restroom at a gas station. Right? It goes from credible to creepy in a heartbeat. Right? Imagine you're standing there washing your hands and some guy comes in with a white coat on and says, take off your clothes. <laughs> I That's suspect awesome. some of your SEAL training would kick in at that moment. Yeah, it might. Yeah. yeah, so... Unless it was one of my instructors, in which case I know I'm being hazed bad. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, so, Covey stuff is sort of representative of some of the material we talk about around these individual components. And, and it's similar to work that was done in the mid-90s. There's three levers there that we can talk about to, to pull to show that we have trustworthiness. And those are benevolence, integrity, and ability. Hmm. And benevolence is, do you have my best interest at heart? Will you act in my best interest? Mm -hmm. Integrity is, do I follow through on my commitments and do my actions line up with the values that I express? Mm -hmm. And ability is, do I have the competence to do what I say I'm going to do? Right. We all have the ability to build trust. Some are just better than others, right? And so... For those who aren't great at building trust, they have a lever that they pull. Usually mm -hmm. it's the ability lever, right? right? I have these kinds of credentials, this background, this much experience, on and on. This is why we say character trumps you know, ability when it comes to trust, right? Yeah, because it's those integrity questions and those benevolence questions. Mm -hmm. You know, Those who are a little better at building trust have multiple levers. I believe mm -hmm. there are 10 levers we can pull. So those who, who are a little better have multiple levers. Those who are really good have multiple levers and they know when to pull which one. Interesting. Right? And so what I do is systematically walk people through the 10 levers. And then I talk about how to pull those levers, which is something we're not seeing a lot in the trust literature. Mm -hmm. Right? We're seeing people say, okay, it's important to have people's best interest at heart. But Mark, I go in front of families and do work with families. And I say to the parents, who here has their kid's best interest at heart? And, you know, all, every hand goes up. Right. And then when I flip it and I say, how many of your kids would say that? It's a third, and it's somewhat hesitant. And so if I have your best interest at heart, but you don't feel it, you don't experience it, it doesn't land. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we actually need to figure out how do we pull that lever in a way so that it lands. And this is the challenge for a lot of leaders because they feel like, I do that. I do those things. Says who? Right? Because me telling you I'm benevolent carries a lot less freight mm -hmm. than you saying, Daryl really seems to care about people, cares about mm -hmm. me. How do you train benevolence? You know, it's kind of one of those things. It's more of a consciousness level, character level thing. I mean, I, I do believe character can be trained, but you're certainly not going to do it from a workshop. So what I do, and, and this has been a learning curve for me as well, right? first few years were really understanding how trust works. Then it was, how do I explain it in a way that people get it? Now I'm really on about how do I get people to practice these skills so that it becomes right. part of their, part of their toolkit. Mm -hmm. So let's take benevolence as an example. What I will say to people is because a lot of times we think we're doing something in somebody's best interest, but it doesn't land that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I suspect that there were moments during your SEAL training when you thought, these people don't give a shit about me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but they were really trying to prepare you for anything that came your way. That's right. 
So they had your best interest at heart, but it didn't feel like it in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I give people a script. And in the, in the book that I wrote, I give people a list of ways that they can pull the benevolence lever, ways they can pull the integrity lever, ways they can pull the ability lever. But what I, what I like to do is, is get them to practice, and your listeners can practice this. Find someone that, that's safe to practice with. Not someone who loves you, someone who hates you, but someone sort of in the middle where you can say, I heard this guy talking about trust, and he said benevolence mattered. And that means having someone's best interest at heart. And I think I do that, but it doesn't always seem to land that way. Mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced that? Mm -hmm. And they'll go, yes, because almost all of us have. Oh, right? Right? And it, reminding me, by the way, not to, <laughs> but the, when a strong impression comes into my head, I often <clears throat> yeah. blurted, it comes out my mouth. But I remember uh, back in high school, and there was this kid in the, you know, in the, in the playground. No, it wasn't high school. It was like middle school. And this kid in the playground, and, and he had just been bullied. And so I go up and try to be benevolent, right, to, to provide some comfort. And he punches me in the face. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, right. what did I do wrong, man? I felt so bad. Yeah. So that, that was what you're talking about. It, it didn't land for him, right? He wasn't right. ready for that, you know. Cause he he was already ashamed. felt weak and vulnerable and right. felt ashamed. He was ashamed, and I just shamed him more by pitying him. And that's, that wasn't right. serving him. Yeah. Anyways, that's an example so, of what you're talking about. I could have used your help back then. You could have. <laughs> and, and so so then, you know, we tell these stories, we have this conversation about moments where we've fallen flat. And then you narrow the funnel and you say, has someone ever really had your back? Have you ever had that experience where you really felt someone was looking out for you? Like they cared and, mm -hmm. and they had your best interest at heart. And that'll cause them to start thinking and it starts to prime them. And mm -hmm. we start asking questions about what, what did they do? What did it look like? How did it feel? Now we're getting hints, right, about what benevolence feels like for that person, what actions seem like benevolence to them. Mm -hmm. and then we narrow the funnel further. And we say, Mark, what did, would success look like for you? How do I help you get there? What would it look like if I was benevolent to you? Mm -hmm. Now we've created a moment of transparency. Because you can tell me what benevolence looks like to you. And I can follow up a week or a month or a year later saying, you remember when you told me this is what success looked like for you? I was thinking about you when I did this. How, how would you define benevolence? Because it's more than compassion. It's having someone's interests. Like we, in the SEAL teams, or actually in, in my training at SEAL Fit, we, try to, we call it taking your eyes off yourself, putting on your teammate. Like literally, yeah. make your teammate's success your success. And then, you know, if you're on a team of eight, you've got seven other people who are looking out for your success. And all of a sudden, you just get all this energy and all this trust. Yeah. Is yeah. Is that what you mean by benevolence? That's exactly right. Yeah, you, you've nailed it. And it's, it's about putting someone else's interests first. It's about being aware of their interests. Right. And, and once, so when my oldest son was 12, he looked at me This is hard, by the way, because, you know, the vast majority of people even in their into adulthood are egocentric by nature just because of course that's their stage of development and we don't have a lot of mechanisms in our western culture to move beyond that individualistic egocentric uh, it's it's stage. it's why the work that i'm doing is so important because mm -hmm. it gives people levers that allow them to actually make change mm -hmm. and they can practice Mm -hmm. Right. So when my oldest son was 12, he looked at me one day and he said, Dad, even when you're upset with me, I know it's about what's best for me. Mm -hmm. That's called winning as a parent. And it means that your actions are interpreted through a positive light. Right. And it's the same thing as a leader. If your people believe you have their best interest at heart, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Right. They're going to ask you when things don't seem right or going sideways instead of just saying, yeah, I don't need to know. I'm just going to coast. Clearly this place doesn't care about me. It's how we combat that quiet quitting. It's, it's how we get people engaged, motivated. They'll go through a wall for you. Right. If, if they believe that you're on about what's best for the team, what's best for them. Right. One of the <clears throat> most powerful tools in the SEAL teams to develop trust was the debrief process. And, the most powerful part about that was 
Well, there's a couple aspects. One was transparency. Like, everything was acceptable. Like, I don't know how they're doing it today with PC woke stuff, but, you know, in my day, like, everything like everything was on the table, and there was no right. topics that were off limits if they, if they degraded the performance of the team. And so th in order for that to work, everybody had to both deliver the cr criticism in a non-personal way, in other words, to discuss how it happened and how it affected you, your perception of what happened and how it degraded yours or the, or the team's performance without saying, Hey, you screwed up. <laughs> right. You know, and you're the, you know, you're a terrible person. And so to, to um, to make it non-personal and then to, and so then that allows the individual to begin to receive as non-judgmental in a non-judgmental way. It's like, Oh, this is actually for my benefit so that I can improve, so that I can be a better teammate, so that I can help and or at least not degrade mission performance. And right. it takes a little while for a new guy, you know, in future, a new girl to make, to get used to that. I'm reminded of Ray Dalio's discussion about meritocracy taking about 18 months for new employees to get used to a meritocracy where it had, they have right. similar attributes. But anyways, I, I just want to get your take on that because I thought that transparency and, and, not projecting onto other people judgment when you're trying to give them feedback. It's di that's difficult work, but it's powerful, I think. It is really powerful, and it, it's, a, it's a mechanism for creating a shared narrative. Mm -hmm. We have this tendency to interpret the world through stories. That's right. And we're usually the center of our own story. That's right. Well, we are. I have. I have this saying that there's not eight. There's not one world. There's eight billion worlds. Right. And and there's some shared consensus reality, but not a whole lot. <laughs> right. And so so part Everyone's of the challenge. Got their own world. <laughs> yeah. And so when, when I I've run into situations where there's people in conflict or or groups in conflict, and what I'll do is I'll sit down with one person and I'll say, "What's your story? How'd we get here?" And I listen, right? I pay attention. I ask questions. I listen. I try to flesh it out. Then I go to the other person independently, separately. What's your story? Mm -hmm. Then I bring them together. And I say, okay, person one, I want you to try to tell me person two's story. Mm -hmm. And it forces them to be, oh, let me try to adopt that perspective. I guess this is what would be going on for them. This is the story they might be telling. This is their experience mm -hmm. of it. And person two is sitting there listening with the opportunity to say, actually, that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. Or, no, that's not how I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and then we flip it. And I say, okay, person two, tell me person one's story. And it gives us a chance to start to create a shared story. That's right. Instead of two different ones. Making. That would be a great mediation training, right, for lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Right? And so... This, this is another one of the levers that we pull when we talk about perceived outcomes, right? Is, hey, maybe we should have, a, like the SEALs are great for saying, here's our objective. This is what success looks like. This is what a good outcome looks like. Mm -hmm. Most other organizations aren't as clear, right? Mm -hmm. Most other teams aren't as clear. They come together, they do something, and then they, they kind of have this retrospective of, well, I think we achieved it or we didn't, or what were we trying to do? Mm -hmm. And so part of what I do when I walk people through this model is I, I talk them through how do we reduce uncertainty? How do we manage vulnerability? How do we understand where it comes from and how to take steps to reduce it? How do we manage perceived outcomes? Both in terms of having a shared understanding of what a good outcome looks like. Because, you know, I, I think about the SEALs example. If if they just sent you out and said cause havoc and, <laughs> and, then, and then said, oh, Actually, target one was really more important than target two. <laughs> we wish you'd hit it first. Yeah. Well, tell me that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that'll we'll be the have plan. Fun creating havoc, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> may not right? help much. <laughs> <laughs> just for the other, just for the other guys, right? Let's get some clarifying yeah. questions right. or havoc for everyone, because, um, and so, you know, if we have a shared understanding of what the goals and objectives are, we have a much better chance of actually achieving them. And if we have a shared understanding of what a good outcome looks like, then, you know, some of this 
challenge we face when when we finish something and people start going well i didn't think that was great and other people thought i thought that was fantastic mm -hmm. and we start seeing really different perspectives on whether it was a good outcome or not who gets the credit who gets the blame mm -hmm. you know these are all places that we can actually intervene there are levers that we can pull to build stronger relationships mm -hmm. and you know when we were talking before i said you know the the old approaches to building trust are are not as valid as they used to be it's because we we need to be more intentional than we've ever been mm -hmm. because vulnerability sure hasn't gone down right our perception of vulnerability if anything is a little higher than it was mm -hmm. but our uncertainty is bouncing all over the place mm -hmm. norms and values are changing the rules seem to be changing the <clears throat> pandemic changed everything and you know we've we've got a group of people in positions of power this is a bugaboo for me you know you talked about politics mm -hmm. a lot of times when i talk to senior leaders and i say would you like to be a politician they say there's no way i put my family through that mm -hmm. i've spoken those very words except i think i would also say there's no way i'd put myself through it <laughs> right <laughs> right and so no, who you. do we attract then a disproportionate number of people who don't give a shit about anyone but themselves that's right absolutely narcissists mm -hmm. right and I think, uh, you know, one of the most popular songs in the U.S. right now is Richmond, North of Richmond. Mm -hmm. It's a protest song. That's right. And it's articulating the fact that there's a lack of benevolence. Mm -hmm. There's this belief that when our politicians lead us, they should be looking out for us, mm -hmm. not themselves. We're not seeing that. Mm -hmm. And so trust levels are at the lowest we've ever seen. It's harder for people to be vulnerable than, than it's been in maybe ever because the uncertainty is bouncing so much mm -hmm. and in that environment leaders need to have as you say the courage to go first mm -hmm. so so leaders uh, organization leaders can bring some sanity to their troops so to speak by i've seen it by developing that trust and giving some certainty back that hey Regardless of what's going on in that political sphere, in the news cycle, and, you know, the lack of trust because of the disinformation and the suppression of information, regardless of all that, we have trust here. And, and we can develop that safety here and that vulnerability. We can build yeah, a safe huge. harbor. Yeah, build a safe harbor. I love it. Right? That, that jives with, with our work. We're trying, you know, we're, we're a small company, too, and, and um, our work is, mo is focused more on integrated vertical development you know, trying to really evolve people's consciousness character so it's very similar because one of the outcomes is greater trust greater courage trust and respect you know those seven commitments yeah and we look at the organization as the best place for that growth to occur which is very different than you know the industrial age paradigm of go to work and then go home and you take your mask off and you know you're somebody different you know no so work can become a community of practice to develop those higher, those qualities that to develop your your sense of self your trustworthiness your respectability and then yeah. everyone can come together in that to to, de great, to develop great engagement and, and psychological safety and to to where you actually really really enjoy work not for the money but because that's where you go to grow right that's where your good experiences are that's where the positive that's impact you have in your life is right. and you know, I I agree completely. There's a huge overlap in in what we're on about, mm -hmm. um, and I think the research is really consistent that higher trust levels lead to higher levels of performance, higher productivity, higher employee engagement, higher profitability. Just on and on it goes. Mm -hmm. That's from before, before the trust levels were so desperately low. How right. valuable is it now? A company mm -hmm. that gets this right has a huge strategic advantage. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious at the organizational level, like you go in and you work with a group and you, you have to do like, first it's information transfer and then you give them these practices. Those practices can be done in role plays or just, you know, opportunistically, but how, how do we scale this? Like, how do we scale trust? Well, I'm trying to do that. Um, that's why I wrote the book. 
because I was having these amazing experiences, but it felt like I was dropping grains of sand in the ocean. <laughs> Understand. I've right? been doing that for years. <laughs> yeah, right, brother? And <laughs> and so we need people to come alongside and pick up great big rocks and help us make <laughs> big splashes. Right. right? And so that's why I wrote the book. I did a master class that's sort of uh, – it's three hours long. It's five-minute segments, right? So it's 36 five-minute segments that's that cool, include yeah. – role plays and exercises that people can practice and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really about trying to spread the word, you mm -hmm. know, that there is a way to get better at this. Like mm -hmm. trust is a skill that you can build. You talked about character being a skill you can, so is trust. Yeah. My, my experience is that um, with development is that most, you know, development, we call it the difference between horizontal and vertical. You've probably heard of those terms you know so so most old you know leadership development programs are you know de develop horizontally meaning you just you're adding new concepts to your toolkit but it's not changing the dial on who you are right. or how you show up it just changes what you know a little bit and and so leaders who go to all these certificate programs and whatnot you know stacking their resume and then you know the, the words come out of their mouth but they're not embodying the change. Yeah. And so for us, real transformation occurs through a process of embodiment, which means you've got to get your body involved. And so we do things that are gritty. Okay. <laughs> you know, like we have one of our programs is like, you want to you train like a Navy SEAL. You want to learn about trust, then train like a Navy SEAL. And, and we have a not 50 hour nonstop training program modeled after Hell Week, Navy SEALs Hell Week. Right. It's extraordinary, but no, we I recognize that not everyone can or wants to do that level of hard. So we have other, our program at Unbeatable. It's like we 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 have people doing things together that seem hard from the outside, but you know once you you're into it, it's actually it's really engaging and fun. So it's perception management. You know we we cook them like a frog and slowly get them into you know the experience, and suddenly they're like, oh my god, look what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and they're building trust, but they're embodying it, right? So they're, they're learning it through their bodies, not through their head, just their head. Right. Head, heart, and hands. Head, heart, and hara. Interesting. And hands. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, that's, that would be very effective for your type of, um, you know, for your content to, to figure out an experiential embodied mechanism to, to uh, you know, build trust, oh. which is the title of your book, Building Trust. Right. You know? and, and that's... Partly what we try to get at is forcing them to have conversations mm -hmm. and practice these skills. And so it's, it's not quite the level of intensity that you have. We say, um, every, you know, we had this saying, everyone wants to be a frogman on a sunny day. It's, it's right. easy to have a, a conversation when there's high psychological safety and you're in practice. It's way harder when you're under pressure and you're emotionally unstable and, you know, but you have to, you have to do it in order to move forward. Right. So, so how do you inject some VUCA into the training itself to make it more realistic? That would be interesting. Yeah, well, and partly I get people to apply it to relationships in their real lives. There you go. Well, there's a lot of VUCA right. in real life relationships, that's for sure. Yeah, like I had, a, I had a student when I was teaching in Luxembourg, one of the MBA students, because uh, all my students had to apply the concepts to a real relationship in their lives. He chose his five and three year old, his two sons. And he said, I think their relationship's broken forever. Um, I've been away most of their lives working in a different country. And I just don't know what to do. He said, I, I'm terrified. I, I, and so I lash out. I get angry. I get frustrated. He said, They're scared of me. Mm. And after three months, his final report was, and, you know, I'd been coaching him, taking him through the concepts, getting him to practice. He said, things have changed completely. They throw themselves on me. They run to me. They fight over who gets to sit next to me at dinner. That's awesome. That's the kind of impact yeah, we're having. Cool. That is cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Daryl, I've um, got to kind of wrap this up. But, so building trust, exceptional leadership in an uncertain world, um, that's out in the marketplace. You can find it on Amazon. Or Anywhere wherever. online. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anywhere online. It's available as an audible book. Oh, good. good. I'm going to get a copy yeah. of that when I hang yeah. out here. Well, okay. and I'd love to hear your thoughts after okay. you read it. Yeah, I will. And 
people can reach out to me at Daryl at TrustUnlimited.com or they can go to my website, TrustUnlimited.com. TrustUnlimited.com. Man, and, this is great. Um, been a great discussion. I really appreciate it. And I, I think this is hugely important. And it's just that one of the, you know, get, there's many vectors, right, that are happening in this world to really help um, pull people up by the bootstraps, you know, become more positive and some of this, uh, you know, endless cycle of negativity and violence. And, yeah. and ultimately, we have to be, we have to be trustworthy and trust each other in order to rise above the the bullshit that we're seeing in the political and, and uh, whatever, whatever you want to call that fear-based world out there, which seems to have us locked in perpetual negativity and violence. And I don't think that's sustainable, obviously. Right. Uh, but it's done for a purpose because it keeps everyone trapped in fight or flight and in victimhood yeah. and, you know, needing the latest pharma of this or, you know, whatever. Well, and it's, the... Yeah, I don't get me going on this one, but the, the well, only the way out of that is to turn off the energy spigot to all that, right? Well, and for us to have collective collaborative action, right? That's to right. be pulling together, all of us That's pulling right. on the rope in the same direction. And that means we need trust. We need trust. We need to pull together. We need to have conversations that debrief. And, and, and you see them trying like heck to, to destroy the trust between different populations, different groups, and even families and individuals. And it's just been relentless over the past 30, 40 years. So well, and we see together. them ratcheting up our perceptions of vulnerability, right? That's right. If you vote for this guy, the world will end. Right. Everything you know, everything you... And and that means that we we can't tolerate any uncertainty at all. We are, we're hiding in our homes. We're not talking to each other. We're not having conversations. All the, all, and the masking thing with this COVID was total... was awful for trust. You know, look at what the kids being masked up you know, and people just avoiding each other. It was awful. I mean, if there was a well, trust meter, the, if there was a trust meter, I bet you mask and, 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 and the uh, stay at home or, or shelter in place orders reduce trust by 50%. <laughs> I'm just and they dra over. dramatically damaged our kids' skills at being able to create That's relationships right. and navigate the world. They did. It was awful. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, well, we're not going to solve that now. But like I said, you know, we have to be the change you want to see in the world. But we can do it together. Right, Daryl? Absolutely. We can do it together. We can. So appreciate you very much, sir. And uh, let's stay in touch. I'd really yeah. like that. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs>